Sweet. <laughs> okay, setting up for meeting for Facebook Live. I, it's a, I feel like the first time I did it, it caught me off guard. And I was like, the first two minutes of the live stream were just me like staring at the computer like this. <laughs> like, what? Okay, I think it's going. Yeah, it says it is. Okay. Um, all right, everybody, we are live. Uh, welcome to XR Live. I'm your host, Aaron. And each Friday, I'll be having a candid conversation with fellow rebels in Extinction Rebellion about the climate crisis, coronavirus, and what we can still do to rebel for life. My fourth guest is my friend Dave, who I met on the steps of the Capitol at my very first climate strike. Um, and you helped me get signed up into Extinction Rebellion. So thanks for that. Uh, Dave, welcome to XR Live. Cool, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I, you were on live stream on XR last night, so you are just all over this page right now. <laughs> so I have some questions about you because I want to get to know just you better, your history and how you got here. So how did you get into activism? Has it always been something you've been interested in? Um, so there's a, like a description of activism that I really like that I actually learned inside XR and it's called like um, tiers of engagement. And so people can be involved at different levels, right? And one level is people that show up, right? And then another level is people who are kind of connected and they do tasks and things. And then like the most core level is people who are like organizing, people who are really putting stuff together. So I've been involved with activism like throughout my life at that show up level. Um, and also prior to the last few years, a lot more on the legislative side as well, like signature gathering and presidential campaigns and things like that. What was like your first, what was like the first show, what, what, what did you first show up to? You know, like what was the first like rally you showed up to or something? So in college, um, I went to some animal rights um, activist events. Nice. And I actually went from, I went to college in Buffalo and I went, I got in a bus and there was this huge rally in Washington, D.C., and I went to a legalized marijuana rally nice. <laughs> in D.C., yeah. That's badass. <laughs> uh, that's really cool. So you've kind of just been in, like, you've, you've showed up for lots of different causes. It sounds like animal rights, marijuana. Um, what other kinds of causes, like, besides Extinction Rebellion, what else have you kind of showed up for? Um, so I was involved with Obama campaign. I was involved with the Bernie campaign both times. Um, there's other groups like, and now we're getting into like more recent, like Colorado stuff, you know, so right. there's Colorado rising, um, sunrise movement. I've attended some of their events. In fact, that's actually how I got started with XR was at a sunrise movement event. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Did you just like meet some XR folks like at that event or how did that go down? Um, so at that one, and this is kind of like jumping ahead a little bit, but okay. Harry was there and Harry had a flyer uh -huh. and he was handing them out. Is that the original <laughs> flyer? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's adorable. <laughs> you can go in like our XR Denver museum or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, cause I, I don't know, I, I kind of thought you were one of like the, founding members like I know like it was established obviously before like were you one of the first folks that started XR Denver's like chapter or like where is it kind of already established um there was a few interested people and I'll kind of I'll go into like the longer story because I think it's more interesting yeah do it so um as I'm an only parent you know and so I have my son and mm -hmm. a few years ago he's in high school he's in college now but as he was getting further, as he's getting older, I, my responsibilities for watching him, like I, I didn't have to be around all the time. So I could right. I basically was also thinking about that, that gave me more time to do activism, but I was also kind of thinking about where should I be spending my time that I have and what kind of a role model, like what kind of father do I want to be? Like what, what behavior do I model for my son? Right. And so that's where I, I started to get a lot more involved um, in different groups. Um, that included DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. Um, and this is all like 2017 to 2018. And there was an event in 2018 I, I wanted to talk about because it really kind of led me to XR and into um, civil disobedience. Oh, okay. So there was um, an abolished ICE camp uh, at the 
the geo center, the actual the um, administrative office, the one in Centennial. And when that got set up, I mean, it was set up with tents and everything, right? So this was it was there. It was unknown how long it was going to be there, you know. And we want geo shut down. We want people released. I'm even wearing my shirt today. Close the concentration. Yep. Nice, great. Um, right. And so that was really interesting because I. I wasn't staying overnight in a tent because I, <laughs> I didn't know what would happen at my house with my son if I did that. <laughs> yeah. If he was in high school, you never, he maybe had a party or something. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But it was really fun, like going to the camp because I was going every day and it's, it's kind of a different atmosphere because there's just tons of time and it was just lots of time to talk to people. Um, and I just connected with so many different people. Who are who are at that camp who I've like continued to interact with or it's been a year and then I catch up with them later. You know, so mm -hmm. it, was, it was very amazing to have like these really long detailed conversations with people. Um, but what really got interesting then is I think about four or five days into the camp, that's when it was revealed and there was a hard blockade at the camp and they blocked the entrance. Um, so I wasn't part of the planning of that at all. But when I heard about it, I like left work and rushed down there. Um, yeah. And it was, it was amazing because first it's like, this is my first experience with a hard blockade. You know, there's multiple people um, with the cast type um, uh, hardware, you know, with, uh, and, and they were all connected like this and they were blocking the entrance. The riot police were there. Right. There was probably like 50 full gear and everything. And it, it kind of gave me an idea of like how powerful um, civil disobedience can be, nonviolent civil disobedience. But it also like mm -hmm. showed me how that one was organized and got me thinking about a lot of different things. Because mm -hmm. some of the people I had talked to, like there was this one woman who was very sweet, um, very religious, an older woman. She was coming down to the camp every day and she would talk with people. She was for the cause. Um, very nonviolent, but as as we as the action got into you know with the riot police and they're marching forward, it kind of turned into more of a conflict of mm. you know you know you get the, the cries out of you know the cops are pigs and things like that, mm -hmm. um, and people like like that woman disappeared you know because this is not the conflict that they wanted to be in, yeah. So I mean it all it all resolved. I mean you know that there was no violence and the, the police eventually actually came in and, and cut apart like the, the hard blockade um, okay. and people went to jail okay. um, and, it, and it ended. But it just had me thinking a lot of like how powerful that was and how impactful. And I was trying to like do like calculations like how much money did that cost? Like what would the, what's the impact, you know, to, for them to have all those people and all that time um, so anyway, so I was at that point, I was following different movements on mostly on Twitter at that point. I was like really into Twitter for some reason. I'm off Twitter now. <laughs> yeah. I like have never really gotten into Twitter and I'm kind of glad about that. I mean, I'm definitely <laughs> like addicted to Facebook and Instagram, but at least it's photos and not like, or memes is really what I'm in for. But yeah, Twitter. I mean, I, but I'm glad, you know, I actually, I'm like running you know, one of the people that run X, like XR's Twitter, XR Denver's Twitter. And so I've kind of had to get more into it. And it's a really important tool for activists for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> well, I could be better. I think there's so there's definitely someone else or multiple other people that are also posting. <laughs> it's yeah, kind of funny. That's good. Yeah. So, so after that event, I was like really following other um, nonviolent direct actions that were going on because that was the same time as Standing Rock. So I was following that right. really closely. And also my feeds, like the XR stuff started coming up because like XR was active in England. And so when I saw that, I was like, oh, this is interesting. And I was looking at like how their tactics for NVDA were different than what I saw at the Abolish Ice camp. You know, like, um, and you know, you get, you hear all this, uh, you hear the stuff about like, oh, being too friendly with the police and stuff like that. But there is something to be said about, about the tone that you want to bring to the civil disobedience, mm -hmm. right? And, and what kind of civil disobedience can you do where 
you don't lose some of the, your allies. Like I saw people left the camp when they saw the confrontation and they, and they heard the language of, you know, how it was presented. Right. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I think everyone I've talked to so far, they kind of reference seeing the XR in the UK, like, especially the colorful theatrical, like, I just remember being very, I didn't, I, I did not know what nonviolent disobedience was. Like, I didn't know what that concept was per se. Like I would never be able to put a word to it nor define it. Um, but just seeing the images of these colorful theater like street protests where instead of it being it looking scary, it looked fun. Like you're having a festival in the street and like the police are just kind of standing there like, how do we shut down this entire festival in the street? That's what appealed to me. It looked really beautiful and fun and photo deck and um I think that's what captured a lot of us, you know, when we first saw those big April protests from the in London um, at those, because it definitely inspired a lot of a lot of us to do. Um, and that kind of gets into my next question, which is like, what draws you to Extinction Rebellion as opposed to all these other nonviolent direct action groups that you've been a part of? Like, what is it about XR that's sort of like gotten its claws in you? You know, um, you kind of just answered that question because. A lot of it was the same thing. Like when I saw XR and I saw all the colors and the banners and, you know, just kind of like a, um, a fun party like atmosphere and a lot of positivity that was brought to it, which, you know, we're, I mean, we're dealing with such a serious issue and our, our futures and our children's future, you know, but, but approaching it in the way that they, that they did, I found it very um, enticing. So, so to finish, to get back to this, um, yeah. I was following XR like around that time, you know, in 2018, and I went to a sunrise movement. It was um, a, a protest type um, event at Diana DeGette's office, and Harry was there, and Harry was handing these out. And I was like, oh, wow, XR is in the US, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. So that's how I got started. That's cool. That's really cool. And like, what has surprised you about joining XR and being having it be a part of your life? Like, what is one element about it being in your life that surprised you? Um, I didn't really like know where things, what I was going to do and where things were going to go. And I mean, it's just been, it's been pretty amazing. Like just the life experiences I've had over the past year and a half now, you know, I mean, it's, I showed up to um, city council and used my two minutes to do a proclamation of rebellion about how we're rebelling from the government. Yeah, that's you know? pretty cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> well, everybody's like died outside the, the city council and, you know, everything that happened back on 420 last year, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the event, the state of the state, I mean, it was just tremendous. Yeah, that, that was, that was a wild event. I mean, yeah. you went to jail with your son. I mean, <laughs> what could be what could be more interesting than that? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it was educational. You know, it's I, I felt kind of good about it at first. Like you're seeing like a different part of life that I think is good to see, and you're seeing how you know people talk about the thin blue line. People on the right, you're looking at a different mm -hmm. line of how 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 cl close we are with our freedoms of they could just be taken away and you could be imprisoned and you don't know, what's wait what's the thin blue line I, I don't know that term oh have you ever seen the american flags where they have the blue line like in the middle and a lot of times people display them um in support of the police because okay. the the theory is is that the police are the thin blue line and without them you know we'd have anarchy and crime and society would be awful without the police oh gotcha Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, that, that also the state of the state action, I will never, I think I will like think about that on my deathbed. Like, <laughs> I think I will think like, I just that image of like us walking into the room, the big room where the speech was taking place. Uh, I mean, cause it was like, we waited so long and then we were walking in there. It was like a dream. I, it was really like, I felt like I was in a dream and it was, I just, I was so nervous and it was just crazy. And I'll just never forget that day. It was, I, I, I was upset. I was nervous. I was excited. 
um, it's just like all the mix of the most intense emotions. Um, and then to be like right there with you, with, with all, with you and everybody else, I don't know, as it was really what, just a wild experience. Um, okay. So, uh, Wednesday was the 50th earth day and we had a lot of plans with other climate change activist groups to make this a huge week. But of course, all of our plans were thwarted by the virus. Um, so what happened this week instead? And do you feel like it was effective in the same way? Um, not effective in the same way. I think it was very effective based on the circumstances. Uh, I think what's come together with the environmental coalition here in Denver is really quite amazing. You know, that we have 350 and we have um, Sunrise Movement, we have the Youth Climate Strike, we have International Indigenous Youth Council, um, Friends of the Earth, Sierra Club, XR, you know, the list goes on and on. We have all these groups and we're coming together. They're all based on, you know, within social justice. Um, there's lots of space given to people, um, people of color, Black, um, Indigenous, youth, you know, so it's, I, I see that whole coalition as a very positive thing. I so, do too. I do too. Um, and I also like, I would love to get someone from one of those groups uh, and I have some ideas of who, but I'd love to interview someone from a different group at some point. <laughs> we can talk outside this. I have ideas too. Okay, cool. Yeah. After <laughs> tell me who you think. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I love that, like being an XR, I've been to a lot of youth led actions and rallies. That's been really cool. Like where we're just, we're really, we're there supporting them. We're, you know, they're leading it. They're the, they've organized it. They're the speakers. Um, I think that's been really powerful for me. Um, and one of the more powerful images for me about that state of the state was seeing the sunrise movement on the steps getting arrested. Um, I was like overcome with despair, you know, and just like sadness, but they were, you know, they were just like singing and like, <laughs> whatever, you know. Um, so uh, I don't know. It's just, it is, our coalition is really, really cool. And I think that is really apparent because you see like this week, even though we can't be out in the streets together, we've been like sharing each other's live streams. We've been on each other's live streams. We've been like promoting each other's events. Like they're all, it's all one thing. Like I see an event from 350 and I know that XR people are going. Um, right. A little bit ahead of myself, but this rent strike tomorrow is not organized by us, but we'll be there. And like, I just think it's really cool. Um, so I like that spin on it, Dave. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> okay, well, I mean, like this is kind of like, I think a lot of what we were we wanted to talk about, but we talk a lot about social issues and Extinction Rebellion as well as climate because of intersectionality. And just because, you know, folks may be watching this now or later, curious about XR, but may not know what intersectionality is. So. I just wanted to kind of take a moment to just sort of step back and like, can you tell anybody watching what that what that word means and why it matters to us? Yeah, I can explain what it means to me. Um, it's, yeah. You know, it's people might come into XR or come into a group and they're they're very focused on a singular issue, which is climate change and what's the carbon levels, right? And you maybe you take an even larger view and you're also looking at like ecological destruction. But how, why are we in that situation? What are the systems that have brought us there? You know, if, if we're not, we need to get to the roots of the problem to, to, to do, to fix things, to make change, right? And so it's not like, this is a lot of humbling type things too, because it's, it's not just like XR is coming in and, oh, we're, we're figuring out the problems. I mean, we're, we're dealing with problems that have existed for hundreds of years. Um, and this kind of goes back to like the demand one, which like, I think about a lot to tell the truth demand, mm -hmm. you know, and I try to apply that to a lot of other things or not even try to, but I have like, it, it's come up, you know, it's like, okay, well, what is the truth of the U S and U S is history. Well, if you look yeah. at it, it's a history of genocide and a history of racism. So a lot of the stuff that you're fed either in, in the media, in school, there's a deeper story. I mean, it's not, you're not learning the full picture. And there's a lot to unpack there, you know, and with my involvement with DSA, I have the same thing with capitalism. You know, it's for my 
generation it's you know it's you hear the word socialism and you're taught that that's like a an evil word you know <laughs> yeah they all use that against bernie didn't they yeah continuously <laughs> yeah so there's a, there's a lot to unpack and so you can see how like how everything is related right it's like well what is what does immigration have to do with climate well why are what's happening in the in the south why are people leaving where they live part of right. it's like american imperialism and, and you know what governments are in place but the other part is climate change you mm -hmm. can't grow food you need to move somewhere else totally i mean one of the biggest like sh like um seismic shifts in our society within the next you know few decades is going to be all the climate refugees that'll yeah. be that'll be you know such a huge that's just one part of this huge giant problem or just a consequence of it, not a problem, just like a consequence. And what are we going to do? Are we going to say we're all equal and you can come be here and we accept that it's our lifestyle that, you know, caught this, this problem is not equal. Like just because you like flew a lot or drove a lot mean that like there's problems in other parts of the world it's very like there's an intersectionality in what we do you know we're not no no man is an island right like that whatever that saying like everything we do affects everything else and so there's things we do in the u.s that affect people in the global south um i mean it's interesting that the the countries that have the lowest carbon footprint are you know some of the countries that are gonna have to handle like the worst effects of this the soonest um so it's almost like that you have to take that into account. It's not just about lowering the carbon, you know, emission, lowering the carbon footprint, getting the about all the people, you know, it's about human beings too and rights ecosystems and all that kind of thing. And so I think what we're gonna get into a lot today or tonight, I guess, whatever it is evening afternoon who knows um it's just kind of like how this pandemic specifically is getting xr to focus in on these social justice issues um and um yeah so with that in mind um we are we're a part of a rent strike tomorrow we're going to be in our vehicles um we're on our bikes safe uh and at safe distances rolling around making lots of noise having our signs taped to our windows um so why is like so just to kind of like make a direct comparison like why is something like a rent strike important to a group like extinction rebellion well cool i, I want to riff back on what you just said as well because yeah do it um what what we're talking about is the social justice component right and we talk about like refugees and that's where i feel like the fourth demand is actually is completely critical and essential to extinction rebellion I mean, we can't we can't be talking about all these people who are coming who are coming to the U.S. People who are immigrants, people who who don't have the ability to live anymore in their current countries, and we can't entertain um, a solution that doesn't include them and isn't centered around the people who are at the brunt of this, a brunt of the problem, but have not caused the problem because the people in the in the poorer countries are producing very little carbon. Um, it's the right. people in the industrialized global north and it's really the richest people in those countries that have produced um most of the uh, emissions um right but yeah and but it's, it's we keep going just to clarify that that point sorry just to clarify it's not a blame or shame on anybody it's just the reality is that like the folks that use the, you know the most carbon to fly a lot or eat a lot of meat or what have you have richer lifestyles that is disproportionately just like those the, the problems that are caused from that will affect the poor communities, the people of color, the people in the global south. Like it's not a blame or shame thing. It's not like you're bad because you're rich and you fly a lot. It's just like that's just how this is working. That's like kind of like that's why when we make a plan, we have to put those people in the front of the, everything and say we have to protect these people. We have to um, or else we're not really solving any anything. Is, I'm just, is that what you're kind of, that's what you're kind of getting at, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I just want to clarify that just because I think some people get like, oh, well, you know, that they gets into the whole, like, why are you driving to the protest? How can a car protest be a climate protest? Blah, blah, blah. But it's like, we don't blame, one of our principles is we don't blame and shame. We're just kind of seeing, we're trying to like, 
pick apart these threads and see what's causing what, right? And just see like, like, just try to take responsibility and try to take that inter that that intersectionality and um and that in everything we do. I think. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Sorry, I also totally would add to that, <laughs> that I mean, while we don't blame and shame, we also are committed to telling the truth, right? Yes. So it's right. We don't hide from awkward realities. We confront right. them. <laughs> yes. And yeah, like last night, I mean, for those of you who missed it, there was an eco fascism, what to, and what to, we're heading for eco fascism and what to do about it talk, which is very informative. Y'all did an amazing job. And there are some uncomfortable truths to, to come up against in those moments. But I like that, you know, Reed acknowledged like these are hard. Like breathe in the re and breathe out the, you know, about what we could do at moving forward so um telling the truth is about facing those things so it's not blame or shame it's just the truth and it's just facing it head on and acknowledging it putting it out there i think that's a lot of what extinction rebellion does we tell the truth and we put it out there and we try to make sure everybody can see it um we try to be that canary in the coal mine kind of so right but you're talking um, about the rent strike and so yes. well i mean we need to actually just pause and just really like um comment on the situation we're in right now because it's absolutely horrible i mean so many people mm -hmm. have lost their jobs unemployment levels we don't even know the unemployment levels because people can't get their unemployment <laughs> right <laughs> you know like they they can't log into the website <laughs> exactly exactly but they're at least as bad as they were in the great depression like there's been no period of time since then where there's been so many people um you know, out, out of their jobs or on furlough. And the government is giving away all this money, but it's not going to the people. I mean, a $1,200 check, well, what do, you, what do you spend that on? Is that your rent and you don't eat or do you eat and not pay your rent? You know, I mean, right. and that's like, how long is that? That's like a month. <laughs> that's not like yeah. three months or something, right? Yeah. So, so the, um, the event tomorrow is, you know, to cancel rent um, and also cancel mortgages. And it covers a lot of things. It's also, we need to get people out of the, the geo concentration camp. We need to get nonviolent offenders out of prison. Yep. You know, because otherwise people are, are going to get sick and people are going to die um, through no fault of their own, just through the system. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, if you're in jail, like, you know, there's, you're already, you already have so little control over your own, like your own, what happens to you every day. So even more so you cannot protect yourself from a deadly virus, you know, to pile that on top of it. I actually just got a notification from Denver seven. Uh, it says that 138 inmates have tested positive for COVID-19 at a Colorado state prison in Sterling. I've 155 tests so far, and there's 200 tests still pending. That's, I mean, that is a state outbreak. I mean, it's, and you, obviously like the majority of inmates tend to be of color. Um, and the, you know, there's all that, all that whole oppressive system that's been in place. That's why the intersectionality is so important because like the, the you know, I think about this a lot when people, when they say like, well, why is it that Black communities, even if they don't make up the majority of a population in a certain city, will be the majority that is infected with this virus. It's like, okay, why is that? Well, because they have underlying health conditions. Why is that? It's because they've been oppressed. Like, you have to get down to the root of it, right? You have to keep going down, 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 and see what is the, uh, the true underlying cause of all this. And I think one thing is that this pandemic is really showing that, that there's like all these underlying stressors that this one thing just rippled through the society and wrecked all of that um yeah. it so really shows the environmental racism that's that we yes. have in the us right yeah it's, it really reminds me of like the flint water crisis it's mm -hmm. it's it's like what did the what who you know who who was in crisis in that moment who got help first um and like I was in uh, New York City for Hurricane Sandy when Hurricane Sandy happened. And, you know, lower Manhattan got going like right away. 
and then parts of Long Island didn't get going for three weeks or, you know, so it's just kind of like there's priorities and there's communities that are never the priority and they never have been. They've always been oppressed and they've always ne not been given the same opportunities as everybody else. And it, whether it's a pandemic or a hurricane or food shortages or water crises, it's going to affect, it's always going to affect those communities. It's like when it rains, it pours. And it's, um, it's, it's unfair because those, those folks that live in those communities uh, was not their choice. Um, they are often born in a cycle of poverty. So it's just, I mean, there's just injustice after injustice. Um, so it's hard to not, it's, it's really, I think, like, because the one thing I asked you about before we went live is like, why are we really, like, we're, we seem to be really focusing on the social justice issues right now. Um, and as opposed to the environmental issues. And um, so I think that's kind of why the pandemic is really uh, like sifting and bringing up these social justice issues. Like- Absolutely. Like um, getting your, you know, oh, well, everybody likes their healthcare from their job. Well, what happens when, you know, however many millions of peop people lose their jobs? It, it automatically shows the weakness of that argument. Um, anyway, okay. I don't know where, where I started with that, <laughs> but we're doing a rent strike tomorrow. It's going to be awesome. Yep. Want to see my signs? Yes, I do. I see one. That's, that one's really good. The cancel rent one. Yeah. Very cancel clear. Rent. <laughs> and housing for all. Yes. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. Yeah. I need, I'm going to make some signs tonight to put on my car. I'm excited. I think I'm going to come on a bicycle. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think it'll be more Jesse fun. Was, the bicycle would be really fun. I like, I have a bike, but it's just getting it to Denver and then like all that other stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's really super important. And like, um, I was talking with my affinity group about, uh, how like there's a group that is sort of focusing on these luxury condos throughout Denver that have these vacancies. Um, and like no one's renting these places. And it's like, why can't we put unhoused folks in these apartments? Like the only thing that's keeping people outside who need shelter, who need to be sheltered in place from this virus, the only thing keeping them from being sheltered in places that are available that have no one living in them is money. That's the only thing keeping them from going in there. And, you know, because of our capitalist society that we've all grown up in and we're, we've all gotten very used to and we think is the only thing that we can do, uh, that's capitalism makes that okay. And I think one thing we're, um, that we agree with with a lot of different activist groups is that capitalism isn't the only way to do things in our society. Right. And kind of unworking I mean, that training. There's enough food that everybody can eat. There's enough homes that everybody could have a home, but the system we have, that's not the way things work out. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's interesting that like, here comes your stimulus check and your landlord's like, hello, like, give it to me. It's like, okay, I don't know. And also we live in Denver where $1,200 doesn't cover anyone's rent. Like, I can't think of very many people that that covers their rent. So I just, I don't know. It's, it's, it is interesting. Okay. So um, let's see, what else should we talk about with Earth Week? Um, so I have in here about stop the money pipeline. Do you want to talk about stop the money pipeline? Yeah, that was something I originally, I think we, XR was going to have a lot of our effort into because we were talking about right. doing, I mean, this is, this is the part where we could do uh, different types of nonviolent direct action, you know, like shutting down banks, um, you know, bring the system down to a halt, you know, hitting, hitting locations throughout Denver at the same time having affinity groups assigned to different locations. And all of that had to be, you know, um, couldn't happen, you know, with, with the coronavirus going on. I mean, there, there was some really good informational um, talks that happened yesterday. And mm -hmm. uh, it, I liked how they really went through like the different um, banks and how they're actually funding Colorado projects, right? So. I mean, if it's one thing to know, okay, JP Morgan, Chase, Wells Fargo, Liberty Mutual, if they're funding, you know, oil and gas, right? But when you hear that 
let's see, that Vanguard, if you have money in Vanguard, well, they have 22 million going into Core Civic and GeoCorp, right? Because mm. this is another interse intersectionality issue. These same companies, besides funding oil and gas, they're also funding ICE, ICE immigration camps. Um, wow. If you have money in Wells Fargo, well, that money is going, is being invested with extraction oil and gas. So you're funding Bella Romero, you know, so it has an effect here in Colorado, depending on where the money is. And just to clarify, Bella Romero is a fracking site in, um, in Greeley. In Greeley, right, thanks. Very close to a middle school. And that was what our state of the state protest was about in January. Just to clarify for anybody wondering. So cool. So one thing that you can do from home with very safely is to take your money out of these banks and put it in a credit union, right? That's kind of, that's a, one of the goals of the, of the stop the money pipeline protests. It's like get people to divest their assets from these banks. Yeah, absolutely. So you can do that at the individual level. And then you can also look at like, if you have, if there's like a retirement account, where is that money going? So you can start to get vocal about, you know, with your employer, with your, you may be locked in on your 401k and you have five different choices and they're all Vanguard, right? So you can, you can get, you can start talking with your company about, Hey, you know, I don't want to invest in Vanguard. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think that's really important because these conversations won't happen unless we start having them. We just have to start having them. Um, so I think that's, I think with the money thing, it does give people that with power within feeling because you do have the choice of where you put your money, where you bank, right? Um, so you can use that power, say, if you take your money out of Wells Fargo and put it somewhere else, that, that, that's sending a powerful message um, to either to Wells Fargo in your own small way or to your employer that you're talking to about that. Um, so I think that's a really, I, I, I was just thinking that that is a really cool action that you can do from your home safely. Because I just keep thinking, like, what can we do right now? It's so, we're so used to, like, we gather in the streets and we protest and we we get all together and that's how we do it. So I like thinking of these new, like, the, not new necessarily, but just alternative ways that someone from their home can, if I'm, I'm sure if you're watching this, you have a level of concern about everything that's going on. That could be an easy way for you to get involved. Um, so that's cool. Um, Okay, so I want to move on um, to our next topic, which is like the growth of Extinction Rebellion globally and the growing pains associated with it. Um, so uh, XR started in the UK, but it's now a global movement all over the world. Um, and uh, I've, Europe kind of plugged in to the national, on the national level with other XR groups. Um, and we are trying, kind of trying something new with horizontal organizing, but there's no one in charge. We're all, there's like little, they were all like kind of hubs and that work together um, to make things happen. And just because it's it's different from you know hierarchical authority, it doesn't mean that it's going to go gracefully, smoothly, or perfect. We're still kind of like figuring it out with NXR and probably nationally as well. Um, so. Uh, like, what have you observed in terms of what XR has done right and what it needs to work on, or just anything you want to talk about in terms of like XR's growth globally, nationally, and within Denver? Yeah, so the area I've been concentrating on lately has been around what we've been talking about, which is um, social justice. And so that was not part of XR UK. You know, they came out with, they had three demands. Right, so we share here in the U.S. We share the, those first three demands: tell the truth, 2025 for carbon, um, citizens assembly, which really should be all people. People's um, assembly, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it had, but the, the word means something too. Like it, the definition of citizens assembly, so it, it, it gets complicated a little bit. Totally, but, totally. But in the U.S. and and we've had this since the beginning, and it was kind of neat because I was actually part of the group at that point in time. We had a big caucus where we came out with the actual language and decided as a group that yes, here in the US, you know, we're gonna have, we wanna have a fourth demand and this is important to us. And we wanna make sure everybody knows there's no question, you know, that that we're centered in um, social justice, you know. So, so we you were a part of you were a part of forming that? Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. That's really cool. <laughs> 
Yeah, this is like, so there's, um, I mean, anyone who who's like on that organizer level that we talked about tiers of engagement can be right. involved on the national or, or even international level. Um, and we haven't really had a caucus since. Um, I remember at the time I was, I was like lightly involved because I was trying to get, I was trying to do a lot of work with XR Denver and it just seemed like so far out there and distracting. <laughs> like, yeah. like I have so much to do here in Denver. I don't have time right. for this. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I really, I mean, I'm on like the XR US like key base channel and I like never look at it. Cause I'm just like, <laughs> Oh, I, I'm, it just feels very overwhelming when there's so much work to do just in our own chapter, but you've done a really good job connecting us. So bravo to you, kudos, because <laughs> it's not easy to organize things locally and nationally. It's really hard. Yeah, I've, I've gotten a lot out of it. I mean, there's the thing about like XR, like one, one of the best things is the people. I never realized that until I joined and like the people I've met you, everyone in XR Denver, you know, it's, it's just amazing. Like the, the people and how unique and how just great people are. Right. And just those relationships, but I've also made like relationships uh, at the national level as well, which is just awesome that, you know, I have, I know, I now know people in Minneapolis and Chicago and Seattle and California that I also have that like deep level of respect and can work with yeah so is it just like that representatives from each chapter get on these national calls and discuss things at the national level and we you kind of like bring it back to us or how does that work um a lot of it has grown lately so this year so far on unlike the the national level we've you know we want to be focusing on um climate emergency, ecological emergency, you know, all of the other interrelated issues, but instead we've been dealing with attacks against XR US, US and the US fourth demand. Um, and, and this is where we have, like you were talking about like some of the growing pains. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that, that I think we have with, or that comes up, it's, it's like a, a, a side effect of having non-hierarchical organization is it's hard to know like, what process is and how things get approved and things like that, mm -hmm. right? So we've, I actually see a few different problems that have come out from that. Um, and it's actually developed into the fact that we now have multiple XRs here in the US and there's another XR now, they're calling themselves XR America and they don't have our same fourth demand around social justice. They're trying to be more like the original demands from the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just not really acknowledging the fourth demand. Yeah, and part of the problem there is we've had, you know, in our chapters throughout the US, um, one of the one of the first things you're told when you start a chapter is, you know, you need to have a conflict resolution process because you will have conflict. And you yeah. also need to have an expulsion process because if, if something doesn't work out and there's there's someone who doesn't get along, you know, you need to have a way that they'll that they wouldn't be part of the group. Um, and there have been local groups who have had to, and we haven't had the, that process here in Denver, which great, wonderful. Yeah. But there's been other there's been other groups where they've had problems with people. And this is like an example, this is an example of growing pains where a person had to be removed from the chapter due to their behavior or they, you know, they don't agree with the um, demands or mm -hmm. some other type of, of problem, you know, and, and I, from what I hear, you know, the, the chapters, it's, it's supposed to be a, a process where people have a chance to talk and you try to resolve. I mean, expulsion would be the absolute last thing. I mean, you want to have uh, the conflict resolution where people can get along, but if, if it doesn't happen, they have, they, it, it does, reach a point where someone would need to be removed. But the problem we have is we've had people who have been removed from chapters here in the US, but they're still in like um, Mattermost, which is our global communication platform. Hmm. And they've actually been, you know, they continue their um, communication and participation in XR at that level. Um, now XR US, if someone has been exposed, expelled from one of their chapters, they, they're also removed from XR US. So XR US follows that process, but we're not yeah. at the point where um, the global, XR global 
removes people from that process. And because of that, we've actually, and this is, this is leading into XR, XR America, because uh -huh. many of several, I'll say several of the people who founded XR America were people who were expelled from their chapters from, really? for various reasons. And so they've, they have a chip on their shoulder. I mean, which would be natural. You know, they, they feel from their point of view, they're feeling probably that, you know, this was unjust and why did this happen? And, you know, things like that. Um, so I, I think that's like an example of a process that has not, is not happening correctly that has caused problems, you know, for us here in, in the US. The other one is, is if, if we have, and let me see if I got the text here, because I contributed to a letter that we, we wrote to the global group. Right. And so if, if, you have, if you have an XR group and it's following the XR principles, it's operating in good faith, it's open for discussion and changes, then they should be the de facto legitimate XR group for their area. So XR US, I feel fits in that category, right? Yes. There's, no, there's no reason to have multiple flavors of XR in yeah. innovation or in any kind of area because it just, right. it just causes confusion. People don't know what, what it actually represents. So yeah. I'm, I'm actually, this is something that we're on the national level, we're taking to the global group and we're hoping to have this resolved because it could be, I mean, this, this could really cause an end to XR in the US. You know, if, if people are confused and they don't think XR is a group that's based in social justice, people are going to be leaving XR just for that reason. And some people already have. Wow, that's that sounds like one, really stressful, and two, just like very, yeah, it sounds like a, a just a unexpected threat to this organization and like to our movement. Um, and it's interesting that what has divided these two groups is the fourth demand like that 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 to me is like because you know we so somehow we're all in agreement of tell the truth we're all in agreement of act now we're all in agreement of people's assembly but we can't all agree on the fourth demand which is to you know a just transition um and 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 retributions like like led for and by Black people, indigenous people, people of color. Um, so what, you know, so these people have a chip on their shoulder. They got kicked out. They're starting their own thing called XR America with no fourth demand. Like, what is this? What, why is it that the fourth demand is what gets these people that are, are you know, that they have a chip on their shoulder from getting kicked, booted out of XR. Why is it that this is the demand that they want to cut out? Um, the arguments I've heard are that First, that the social justice part would be covered by the, the People's Assembly or Citizens Assembly, right? So that if you have a sedition and you're bringing people in, it'll, it'll, it'll kind of almost like magically happen. Um, they do actually have a fourth demand. It just, it's completely different tax. It's basically took, it's almost like a white lives matter type interpretation of the fourth demand. Um, it's, it's just watered down language. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, there was something else I was going to, to say about oh and the reason that they they don't want to have that is they're trying they want xr to be a movement that is open to all people like they they feel that if you have this social justice component that it makes it harder for people some people to join right the, like this should be a non-political type organization and we welcome people to come in and to be a part of this and we don't want to you know we they don't want to be basically seen as a left progressive group where it's, you know, especially with political climate here in the US, uh, you're not going to get people who are more conservative and to the right to join. Hmm. So it's, it, it's interesting that what they, what they might think as not being inclusive is excluding like all those groups that the force demand puts at the forefront, I, you know? Mm -hmm. um or or another interpretation is it just ignores the intersectionality between uh you know cl the climate crisis and the crisis our social crises like the fact that like when anything happens 
poor communities are going to suffer more. Um, people of color are going to suffer more, no matter what a cr the crisis is. Um, so I, I find that interesting. Obviously, it's a huge problem. So what are we sort of doing in XR US or, or in XR Denver to combat this? Okay. Yeah, this is perfect because this is the next thing I want to talk about. So there's, nice. we started, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Segways, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> we started a work group within um, XR US called XR Justice. Mm -hmm. And you had asked earlier yes. about how do I have these connections with other people? I've actually built those connections more recently with the whole formation of this XR Justice group. Um, and like, like for, because we're, we're, we're meeting, we're talking with each other. And especially now that we're moving to so many like digital presentations and trainings, we're able to um, see each other more and participate together. You know, for example, on Wednesday, I was on um, an XR justice training um, that was out of Seattle, right? And that was on that was on the XR, people should go to like the XR justice Facebook page and you can like see events you'll see XR Denver events in there and then you'll see other events too that are, you know, other Zoom or Facebook Live type calls. And then like our, our um, heading for ecofascism and what to do about it talk yesterday was also on there. So we had a lot of people from around the US um, who are a part of, the, of that call as well. So it's, it's been really nice to really develop the network and get to know the people in the US more and not just see like you know, the key base name handle and not really have like a face and, and know who that person is. Right. So it's interesting how the pandemic is actually making us look more nationally as opposed to like just having our meetings in Denver. Now we're like, we can hop on a Zoom call in Seattle. We can hop on a Zoom call in Boston. Um, and that's really cool. We can get those perspectives from and yeah, put the face to the name so that we can maybe coordinate even better moving forward. Nationally, we can have a more like coordinated effort because we know these people and you know xr justice uh is you know i'm trying to think of what i'm trying to say here like it's a way for the like-minded folks who believe in the fourth demand to organize like on our own without you know with 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 other folks who like want to include that fourth demand in our actions. And when we plan things, we are thinking about that. Like we're thinking, you know, we're, we're in, we're in that mindset. We're not just, you know, carbon emissions need to go down. We're, we're including all the other elements into it. So it's kind of a good space to be with like-minded individuals in XR. Um, Cause I can't imagine how frustrating it must be to just like be on calls where people are refusing to acknowledge the inter intersectionality between climate change and social justice. It's just, yeah. Um, it's, and I'm 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 upset that XR America is a thing and that it's confusing people away from what XR US is. It's just that's just very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And so we at XR US wrote a letter. Different chapters contributed to it, including XR Denver, um, and it's it's basically pointing out the faults with XR America and how we feel that they're not legitimate and they should not be using the XR name. So I am hoping like also like when you hear people in XR, like in XR UK and around the world, like they look up to the US and us having a fourth demand. And there's other countries, you know, that have followed suit and also have um, a justice-based fourth demand, you know, around the world. So I see like within the general um, people in XR, there's like tremendous support. Like I, I, I don't see this, this XRA just seems to be a handful of people who they're very well organized and they're, they have, they're producing like lots of content and videos and stuff. So they're, they are definitely mm -hmm. like um, showing up in the space, but I don't see them as having a large XR support. They do have some support from some of the XR founders from the UK. Hmm. which is disappointing and also kind of is no, another one of our kind of um we're talking about you know xr growth problems right that these some of the people who founded xr i think because they didn't have the fourth demand in the beginning 
<laughs> they're thinking, well, that's not really part of XR. You know, I don't right. know. I don't know what they're thinking, but it's they're they're supporting XR America, um, which is unfortunate. I, unfortunate. I don't think most people in XR, you know, I, I think most people in XR are supporting XR US with our fourth demand and and enjoy the fact that we have social justice baked, baked in. I think I kind of think the opposite of what XR America thinks. I think the social justice element will draw more people in and will actually make XR more diverse. So because I, I was listening to this NPR story that just stuck with me so much as a climate activist, they were interviewing this black woman. I think she's she's a she's a climate activist or she's in a she's in an activist group that has to do with environmental issues. And she was basically saying that her black friends would be like, why aren't you, why don't you care about a black issue? Climate's a white issue. Like you should talk about what you should care about mass incarceration, something that is affects your community. And I found that very interesting because I've always wondered why, you know, like why, you know, why are in the US or has environmentalism, it, environmentalist groups been historically white. And I realized if we put this social justice element in there, we will open up the, you know, we can open the door because suddenly those issues that are more present in those communities, you can say like, we care about those issues. We need your voice. We need your uh, ideas. Um, and then we can kind of all join in under this umbrella of like, not just climate, but mass incarceration and police brutality um, and, uh, and water rights, right? We pair, we, we, uh, we do a lot of events with the Indigenous Youth Council and support them. Um, and I think that will just make our movement bigger. Uh, so it just, it, it is very like, it's just very strange that they, that XR America would think that take the fourth demand is actually like excluding people or will like make people not want to join. Um, they may make some people not want to join, but uh, hopefully they'll be like as, time moves on and we unearth more and more of these injustices and tell the truth more and more these people will start to re like more, that population will be less and less of the people who don't think that social justice matters um i mean i feel like you know being a privileged white person walking throughout my life being in extinction rebellion and just going through life i've learned so much more about the social justice issues that i never really had to think about growing up um so it is a process for people and um hopefully the more people get clued into that the more important it will become and the more that that mindset that that doesn't matter is going to like, go away and mm -hmm. and we will bring just bring in more people into this movement that's my hope um i think focusing on a lot of the local issues too really helps so we look at I mean, you look at Suncor and the most polluted zip code in the US right there in North Denver. Um, and, you know, it's, it's no surprise that that's a, a minority community there. So we show up and we fight against Suncor, we're showing up for others. And that actually, I mean, you don't, you're, you don't get respect, you don't get um, unity or solidarity just for existing. You have to show up for the other groups and once you show right. up for the other groups that's how you build the solidarity right right yeah like um you know one of my favorite things that i heard bernie say towards the end of his campaign i don't know he probably said it like a bunch of times but i just really like attached it towards the end was let's fight for someone we don't know yeah. i loved that phrase i was just like yes this is like what it's all about um, because you can go on and on about, well, I have my health insurance and I have my retirement and I have my house. And so I'm good, right? There's that mentality of like, I've got this and we're really learning how to fight for other people in this pandemic. Like wearing a mask doesn't protect you as much as it protects another person. Like scientifically, you are, you are more like, you are actually like repressing you spreading the virus than you, it's not protecting you per se. So wearing masks is a sign of saying like, Hey, i want to, I'm looking out for you or that. Yeah. So, cause that's, you know, cause everyone's like, well, I don't feel sick. I, I, I you know, I want to leave and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I can relate cause I'm getting stir crazy too, but we have had to take this moment and think about other people, think about the elderly, think about the immunocompromised. Um, and to hear, I mean, to hear politicians in plain language say the economy is worth more than lives is 
it's just a it's a very jarring statement and it should encourage everybody to think to to stay strong and and stay in solidarity and join extinction rebellion for sure <laughs> and fight for someone you don't know because these people and these politicians they're not going to do it so we need to do it I would add to that, you're also fighting for yourself because in this country, you're like one medical emergency away from being homeless or right. being in any of these situations for the people that we're showing up for now. Absolutely, yeah, they, that, that's a really powerful like thing that I've heard said is like, you're three bad months away from being homeless, but never three good months away from being a billionaire. Like, <laughs> so it's like, you, you, we are really more, we're like, you know, they say the 99%, like we're, we truly are like all, you know, the 99% is we're on the same level, but they've, I don't know, they've just somehow people think they don't really think that way, even though, you know, like my, I, I convinced my dad to vote for Bernie. Like I finally, like he, he's a Democrat, like a bleeding heart Democrat has been his whole life, but has never been on the Bernie train, but I like convinced him. And he's like, it's interesting that the policies that Bernie is putting forward are policies that would actually hurt me a little bit, you know, it financially, um, he may have to pay a little bit more in taxes or what have you. Uh, and then the people that would benefit are the people that oh, call it, call him a, a communist, you know, it, like people in rural communities that are blue collar and are, you know, they don't, they don't have, you know, insurance and they don't have that kind of support from the government. Like, I just don't, it's really interesting. That's a very interesting, that's always like fascinated me that these policies that will like certain people that would be helped by these policies are also people that are just diametrically opposed to it. The ideology just as it stands because it exists in that way, they're opposed. And I think maybe, I hope we can unpack that to bring in people as opposed to being like, oh, there's no social justice. So now you can join. It's like, there is social justice and it matters to you. So now you can join is mm -hmm. like, I think would be effective. Cause I think a lot about how do we bring people that hate climate activists to our side or think that climate change is a hoax how do we bring them to our side how do we show them the truth so this the the facts of the science isn't going to do it apparently so you know how can we change the hearts and minds um and i know that's that's just something we reflect on all the time that's just that's a everyday thing that we in xr think about and improve upon each day yeah. so um I don't know where I was really going with that, but <laughs> it's interesting that we, we talk about like mobilizing 3.5%, but I really like to think about the 99% instead, the well, Occupy level, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We share so much together and we have so much power. That's another reason I didn't really get into earlier of what really brought me to XR was realizing that, you know, the power that we have um, outside of the political system. It's not like you only have power when you go and vote and then you got to wait four years or two years or whatever before you have any power again, you know? So right. if we can, we can bring people together and people can realize that we all have the same issues and we can stick up for each other, then we could really make some changes in this country. So that's, that's what I'm fighting for. <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah, you are. That's why, I mean, you've always, you're you, like, you're, you're always on it. You're on top of it. You're a great communicator. Uh, you have wonderful ideas and in every action you're like in the middle of it somehow doing something important um and i just feel like you're just you're sticking up for you're sticking up for everybody you're sticking up for yourself you're sticking up for your son and his future and your future and it's it's really inspiring so um you know i think you're doing it and keeping us connected on that national level like the fact that you know xr organizers in minneapolis um is so important because we just need that link and that's i'm not doing it <laughs> that's not my my role but we all have our own roles which is one thing i've really loved about extinction rebellion is i didn't have to like i i learned i've learned uh so 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 much from being in it but i didn't have to like there was no prerequisite for me to join like in fact it was like you do music you know like the first time like i met you and i met luke um who we all miss very, very dearly. And um, I met Pooja and like, you all were just like, you're a musician, like we need music, like we need music group. And 
like Luke just held my hand through the process, got me on Keybase, like encouraged me to find a spot to do music, showed up to every music meeting. And like, I just felt like, because the reason why I went to the climate rally was I had this big dark cloud of depression over me about the state of the world. I couldn't shake it. Went to the climate rally, met y'all, started music group and it all went away. And what I was replaced with was a sense of purpose and a sense that what I'm good at is, is helping. And then at one of my very first actions, it was like, they gave me the microphone. They're like, sing, we need a, we need a song. And I was like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> like I can definitely sing. I don't know if I can organize a soft blockade or I don't know if I'm ready to be arrested, but I definitely can sing, you know? And then as I've gone through, you know, however many actions now I've, I've found my footing as an activist um, through NVDA trainings, through talks, through meetings. Um, and I'm much more confident now in my ability to just simply be an activist, not just a musician. But I love that XR like encouraged me to use what I'm good at in order to join and to contribute and to learn. So I think that's really cool about XR. You've brought a lot to XR and it's really appreciated. And I remember like when when that video came out with the four demand song, that was like at a point where where XR Justice was just starting. And that got shared like everywhere because everybody just loved it so much. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. it like touched everything we were talking about at that time. You know, and yeah. it was so it was so like not light, but like just fun and community type song. And the songs are so much more fun to do than like chants, especially chants that are kind of more negative, <laughs> that don't bring people in, kind of like shut people out instead. Songs bring people in. So songs are just so awesome. Songs are like, it's like, it's a peacemaking thing. It's like, it's holding the flower up when the tank's rolling towards you. That's what a song does. Chants can get you like going. Like there's been times when like we're at a, at, at a protest or at an action and chants have just like felt really good. Um, yeah. But then there's times where like, we're wiped and we don't know how we're gonna, you know, go to the next street and do our next, you know, light cycle. And, but we sing and it just, it's, it makes it a little bit more cheery. Um, yeah, the four demand song, I was inspired by this song I learned in uh, elementary school that lays out the um, articles in the Bill of Rights. <laughs> it's like article one, da 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 I, I, da, I think da, I know da, exactly da, what you're talking about. I forget the name of that. It's like a PBS thing. Is it? I don't know. I just remember, I have very vivid memories of elementary school music. Like, <laughs> that's why we can't cut music. Like, I I loved music class. Obviously, I'm like a musician now, but back then as a child, I was just like super excited about music. I learned a lot. We did like Martin Luther King concert. We sang a bunch of Martin Luther King songs. It was, we had a wonderful like singing program. And I, these tunes are like still in my head. Like, I can't remember like what I did yesterday, but I can remember the friggin' Bill of Rights song. And I just jacked like the first part of that melody. And that's how we came up with the, <laughs> should I just play it? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Uh, I was like, yeah, okay. So everybody, uh, if you don't know the four demands, this is the song that'll help you remember. Article, or article. <laughs> <laughs> See, it, it's, a, it's a total rip off, at least just the first couple notes, but shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, number one. Tell the truth. It is in hard to do. Number two, act now. We can show you how. Number three, assembly. Made of people like you and me. Here's this is important. In the USA, we have one more. A just transition is number four. Frontline people of all kinds will not be left behind <laughs> okay yeah so and then you can just repeat it over and over ad nauseum until you're it's like the song that never ends you know um, so yeah i'm so glad that, that had some use we had a lot of fun writing it it was really great um okay i just wanted to clarify because isis uh put this in the comments that it's a car what's happening tomorrow is not a wrench strike yet it's just simply a car protest or just a street protest um at safe distance so it's not a wrench strike just wanted to clarify that um, okay uh okay so 
what and is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we wrap up um i think you had a pretty good out there with the song <laughs> i know right like, i don't how know if i we... can top it you know, know. at this there's point only, there's only one way to top it there's only one way to top it um, got another song okay yeah we're gonna let's sing never doubt <laughs> yeah okay Okay, well, before we'll, we'll, we'll play this song and then we'll leave. So I would like to thank Dave for joining me. Dave, you're so smart, you're so cool, you're so fun, and you're radical. So thanks for, for coming on XR Live with me. Um, thanks everyone for watching either now or later. Um, until next time with fierce love and solidarity for the earth, uh, we say good night to all you rebels with this Margaret Mead quote that was turned into a song that our dear friend Luke showed me and then we we figured it out in music group last summer. So this one's for Luke, we miss you. Never doubt that a small group of people can change the world indeed. It is the only thing it ever has. Never doubt a small, a small group, group of, of rebels. <laughs> yeah, I could change the world indeed. It is the only, the only thing, thing that ever has. Never doubt that a small, small group, group of group rebels <laughs> change the world indeed. It is the only the thing world. that ever has. That a small, a small group, of, group people of people can change the world indeed. It is the it's only the thing that ever has. <laughs> it's kind of like a round with the Zoom because, <laughs> you know, because of the delay. Um, you rock, you're the best. Everybody have a great night. And um, hey, text, type to me who you think I should interview next. You said you had an idea. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye, Dave. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you. Bye.